Top 100 lists for 2024 are out, and there's some notable prospects that made it last year that didn't make it this year. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, come on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, award-winning baseball writer and podcaster, and thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're proudly part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day, and today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today, and you'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So in the spring, prior to spring training, January and February, that's the big top 100 prospect list. All of the different Baseball America, MLB Pipeline, Fangraphs, ESPN, everybody puts their lists out. And something I, I consume all of them just like everybody else, just like all the prospectors out there. And something that is really interesting to see Obviously, there's a lot of movement on these lists now because you have the prospect promotion incentive and various things to incentivize teams to get prospects to the majors. But it's really interesting to see the guys that are still prospects and fell off the list. So I wanted to take, jump in here and look at six guys who fell off of one or multiple top prospect lists between last year and this year and discuss why. So... Let's start off with some catchers, right? Diego Cartaya of the Los Angeles Dodgers, Kevin Parada of the New York Mets. So for Cartaya, let's do him first. 2019 IFA and got 93 games in double A last year and really struggled in Tulsa. 189, 278, 379 in those 93 games. 19 home runs, 29 extra base hits for Diego Cartaya, 37 walks to 117 strikeouts. And this is in stark contrast to what he did in 2022 at the age of 20, divided between single A range Cucamonga and high A Great Lakes, the Loons, I think, yeah. There, between those two t- leagues, 254, 389, 503, with 22 homers, And 119 strikeouts, so roughly the same number of strikeouts in the same number of games, but 63 walks in 2022 versus 37 in 2023. And this one's really interesting. I think this is a combination of us maybe overrating certain aspects of his game combined with him trying to do too much or pressing too hard. So the thing that I think we got wrong with Diego Cartaya, and by we, I mean the prospect apparatus in general, was maybe reading too much into his 30 games in single A in 2021 to establish that he had a, an average or better than average hit tool. He batted 298 in 2021, but again in 31 games. And last year, I think is more emblematic of who he was as a hitter, batting 254. And then this was 189. And so th- this is the second straight year, or last season, was the second straight season of putting up an overall contact rate below 70%. And so I think part of the issue was we thought Diego Cartaya's hit tool was better than it was. I also think that this is a classic example, and team officials have acknowledged this as well, of a player trying to do too much. I mean, he climbed up, I want to say he was as high as maybe number 14. Like, I think everybody going into last season had him top 20. And looking at the notes here, yeah, MLB Pipeline had him at 14. Baseball America had him at 18. Baseball Prospectus had him at 19. So everybody had him inside the top 20. And in retrospect, I think that was a little bit high. But I think also... He really struggled trying to balance the demands of catching and getting better offensively and then press too much when he started to slump. So if you watch Diego Cartaya hit last year in Tulsa, 
his mechanics became a bit of a mess. It's never been... To me, it's never been a really compact swing. And that's, I think, going against... Maybe it's Baseball America put that he used to have a really short, compact swing. I've never really seen a compact swing. It may have been average length. But the swing got really long uh, over the course of last year. And to try to explain some basics behind that, swing length is essentially just uh, the, the amount of movement that the barrel of the bat has to travel to get to the ball, right? The shorter the swing, uh, the shorter the distance, the shorter the swing. The longer the distance, the longer the swing. And like a longer bat path isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? The more time that the bat has to travel, the more bat speed you can generate. So the more power that you can get. And also having a long but optimized bat path means that by the time the bat gets into the zone, it can already be on the proper plane for the pitch. And it could spend longer in the zone. The issue is, and I think you see this when you look at Kartaya, the issue is the longer the swing is, the earlier you have to pull the trigger on actually swinging. And when you watch Diego Kartaya, a lot of the issues were getting beat by spin, especially sliders down and away. And when you go back and you watch how long the swing is, he's mentally already committing and firing off that swing before the slider has begun to break. And so even if the pitch recognition was really good, which it's obvious it's struggling a little bit, he's already committed to the swing when the slider starts to break. And so... I think some of the issues that he has offensively are not recognizing that spin, but then also he can't stop his swing in time to get to it. And then that long swing means he's also susceptible to fastballs up and in, right? He has a long swing. If you can get that pitch on him inside in a hurry, he can't get the bat around to get to it. So shortening the swing would be good. I also think this is... When you watch, and Andrew Friedman acknowledged this in the offseason, he was pressing, trying to fix everything. He's one of those players. You don't want somebody who doesn't care, and the joke here is Anthony Rendon, but he maybe swung a little bit too far in the other perspective of he put so much pressure on himself to be everything the Dodgers wanted him to be. He's focusing on improving the defense, He's gotten better on framing in a lot of respects. He still didn't have a great caught stealing. It was like 19%. He was he allowed 78 of 96 base stealers. But so much focus on game calling and defense that he was then pressing at the plate to make the offense work. And honestly, I don't necessarily think there's a massive reason to be concerned about Diego Cartaya. Do I think he's probably right to not, not be in the top 100? He probably is. But at the same time, I don't think that... I still think he has a chance of being a big leaguer, right? And it's all going to come down to some mechanical tweaks to the swing. As well as probably another year in AA Tulsa. Give him another chance to to not have the pressure of moving up to AAA and being one step away from the bigs. Kevin Parada is the other guy. Uh, first rounder out of Georgia Tech in 2022 to the Mets. 105 games last year. 248, 324, 428. 14 homers and 41 extra base hits, 36 walks to 126 strikeouts, mostly in the lower minors, one for three on stolen bases. We've talked about this before. He was atrocious at stopping opposing base dealers last year. 18% caught stealing. He allowed 129 of 157 stolen base attempts on him last year. I think it was a top four number for most stolen bases allowed in the minors last year. He's done some things to fix that, right? Andrew Christie, the assistant farm director, talked about he added, I think it was three mile an hour in arm strength, like in in the velocity of his throws last season. The framing got legitimately better. Uh, uh, He still struggles a little bit with like elevated fastballs up in the zone and things like that, but the framing got better. The throwing mechanics and stuff got better. Some of that, I feel, is just the arm itself is unlike Cartai, who has a plus arm. 
Harada isn't just necessary. The arm strength is not necessarily there to ever be good with the running game. But offensively, that's your real issue here for Kevin Parada. It was a 65% contact percentage. He swung over 50% of the time. And so 7.8% walk, like 28% strikeout rate. I don't know if you can fix all of these things at the same time. I don't know if... I think Kevin Parada's ceiling as a catcher is a number two simply because he's going to be such a liability in the running game. I think the best way for them to do their catchers in an ideal scenario is Francisco Alvarez is your guy who starts four or five days a week. Parada catches once or twice, plays some first base as well. Maybe if you don't resign Pete Alonso. But I just don't know if that arm strength's ever going to get to the point where he can even get to fringe as far as controlling the running game. And then offensively, he just, like, he's been working so much on defense that the offense hasn't caught up to where it arguably should be for a top 10 pick and a, a power five performer, right? So maybe some more balance is needed. I don't quite know how you handle this, but this, everything is there for Kevin Parada to be a major leaguer I just don't know how much longer you in continue to insist that he works as a catcher and put all of your development focus on the defense when now the bat is starting to lag behind because he's not putting in the work over there. In just a minute, let's talk about some outfielders for the Washington Nationals and what they can do to fix their drafts or to fix their prospects stock. We'll do that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The things that win you championships is also what keeps your vehicle running. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. They have over 122 million parts for your vehicle. Uh, with eBay Guaranteed Fit... This thing is great. Your part's guaranteed to fit every time or your money back. You put in what you drive. I drive a Jeep Wrangler. And they tell you exactly what will and will not fit your vehicle. And again, if it doesn't fit, you get your money back. They have all the parts you need at the prices you want. So keep your vehicle running at peak performance at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Okay, so looking at some Washington Nationals outfielders, I want to talk about Robert Hassel and Elijah Green. Uh, Robert Hassel, first rounder in 2020 out of high school by the Padres. He was part of that Juan Soto deal, whereas Elijah Green was drafted by the Nationals in 22's first round out of high school. So for Hassel, 121 games between A ball and double A last year. And it was like the first month, and then he moved up to double A. 221, 324. 321, nine homers, 27 extra base hits, 68 walks to 161 strikeouts, and 15 of 20 on stolen bases. The contact rate lagged behind a little bit, 72% contact, and the power came out 90 miles an hour, average exit below 102, I think 0.2 or 0.3 on the 90th percentile. And reminder, 103 and change is major league average. So it's just below major league average for 90th percentile exit velo, which is more descriptive of overall power than, than average exit velocity, or even your max, really. There's a couple things that I, I'm trying to figure out if it was intentional or accidental. So he changed his swing, and when you watch, it's a different bat path than it used to be. And we talked about the length of the swing in the first segment, but this bat path for Robert Hassel looked to be really steep for a lot of the year last year. And so the obvious kind of assumption here is that he was adjusting his bat path to try to get more loft on his batted balls and hit for more power. And I don't necessarily think it was doing him a bunch of favors. Now, if you look at some of his stuff from late in the year, in the month of September, it was much more of a not flat, but a closer to flat bat path than he showed earlier in the year. Coincidentally, 
September was his best best month. We got 14 games, so it's not a it's not an incredibly descriptive sample. But in the 14 games of September, he batted 281, 349, 351 with five homers and 16 strikeouts, with one homer and one double. Among he didn't have a ton of hits. It was only 14 games, so uh, it, it was. You see the strikeout rate come down. You see the contact get better, the batting average, the on-base, the slugging. Everything was better in the month of September. If he went back to his original bat path of stop not trying to lift everything, but just getting quality contact on a not neutral, but slightly elevated swing plane, then it feels like that's the path to him getting back to a hitter that could be an average to above average hit tool. Because that is concerning. The other thing, though, when you watch, and this is, I do not know any details about this. I have not heard people uh, who know, acknowledge, or discuss this. But when you look at him in 2023 versus 22 and 21, from a physical perspective, he looks smaller, like he lost weight. And so I, I'm i not going to speculate as to if that was intentional or accidental or if there's a medical thing or whatever, but it feels if you combine uh, somebody losing weight for whatever reason it may have been combined with trying like intentionally changing your bat path to try to trade off some contact for power, but not having the physical base to support that power, you can see how the numbers would significantly drop. So if that bat path, if that new swing change from September holds and there's nothing physically wrong that would cause a weight loss and he puts some of that weight back on and maintains it, you could see how he could easily get back into the top 100 with a good year in 2024, which is needed because this team now has uh, Dylan Cruz as the number one outfielder, Elijah Woods up there. I'm sorry, Elijah Wood's an actor. James Wood. I'm thinking of Elijah Green and James Wood at the same time. James Wood and Dylan Cruz ahead of him. And so you're battling for that third outfield spot. So Robert Hassel needs to get back onto track in 24, but you can see how he could do it. Elijah Green's a little bit of a different scenario, right? So first rounder in 22 out of high school, 83 games last year between rookie ball and A ball. Uh, we knew there was some work to be done. I don't think we expected this. 218, 336, 327. Five homers, 21 extra base hits, 52 walks to 150 strikeouts in 83 games for Elijah Green. It's a 42% strikeout percentage. 31 to 36 on stolen bases. So the power is absurd, right? 90th exit velocity of 110, okay? Power is not a question. Speed's not a question. 70 grade speed. Stolen base numbers, 31 to 36. You can see it when you watch him play center field. You can see that as well. The issue is we knew the contact was a work in progress. It is more of a work of progress than we realized it was going to be. Overall contact of 56% last year. Zone contact of 62. And what exacerbates this is he also swings more than 50% of the time. So not only does he swing a lot, he also doesn't make a lot of contact, which is a recipe to strike out 42% of the time. When you watch it, it's a really big swing. It's a long bat path. There's a lot of moving parts, and it's not very smooth. But I did see some video, and this is small sample size. He shared this. I think it was on Instagram. He simplified the setup in the swing. His hands are higher. The swing itself is shorter into the zone. And this is a scenario where he has enough natural power, like Diego Cartaya. He has enough natural power where he can get away with a shorter swing and still produce from a power perspective. His focus should be correctly, and what he did, streamlining the setup, streamlining the swing, the bat path to get into the zone as soon as possible and stay in the zone for as long as possible. And if he needs to not have an uppercut swing, but have a level line drive swing, that's probably the best thing to do because there's enough natural juice in there where if you solidly strike a line drive, that sucker's going to backspin out. 110 mile an hour, 90th percentile exit velo, 
His max was like 118 last year. He can make it happen from a power perspective if he can just make quality contact. So if those swing changes hold, which is going to be the big question, if those swing changes hold, you could see how Elijah Green could tick up. If that strikeout rate can go from 42% to 35 this year, I think the other tools are so loud that he can get close to being back on the top 100 just by cutting strikeouts by 7%, right? And if he gets a 10% jump, which isn't doesn't always happen, rarely happens, but it has happened before. And if he can do that, he can easily make it back to the top 100. Uh, in just a minute, let's talk about two guys that had some medical issues that caused them to fall off this list. Zach Bean of the Rockies and Daniel Espino of the Guardians. We'll do that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. They are just ready for basketball over there on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. It's $150 if your bet wins. Hopefully, your bet was on the over for the All-Star game because that was absurd. Something like 400 points in that All-Star game. I don't understand how MLB has the only All-Star game that people actually try and care about in. But either way, you can bet all your favorite NBA players and teams, quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. And then you can use those bonus bets on baseball, right? You can come over to baseball. We have Rookie of the Year odds. We have Cy Young odds, World Series odds, Division Winner odds, all kind of stuff. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to shoot your shot with FanDuel, the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Final segment of Locked On MLB Prospects, uh, and looking at some former top 100 guys who uh, fell out of the top 100, in this case because of medical issues. Zach Veen of the Rockies, Daniel Espino of the Guardians. So for Zach Veen, reminder, first rounder in 2020 out of high school, only got 46 games in AA last year. And he was coming off of a good but not great year in 22, divided between High Spokane and AA Hartford, the, the, the yard goats there. 126 games in 22, he batted 245 with 12 homers, also stole 55 bags. Last year, in those 46 games, 209, 304, 308. Two homers, 11 extra base hits, 23 walks to 43 strikeouts, again in 46 games and 22 of 24 on stolen bases. So, and he publicly commented on this late in this, I think early in the year last year, that he was trying to get back to who he was as a hitter. And when you watch in 22, it really looks like the organization tried to make him into a guy who would hit the ball to all fields, distribute the ball around, hitting to the gaps, hitting line drives, getting doubles and things like that. And so he established that he's trying to get back to who he is, which is a guy that is just going for optimal contact. And if he pulls the ball, he pulls the ball. He, he Zach Veen got nine games in the Puerto Rican Winter League. So it's a very small sample. I saw just a couple of those at-bats. Uh, he batted 429, no homers, but four doubles. When you watch him, he was ripping balls to the pole side. And I've seen him before, both in Hartford before the injury and in 22, as well as some stuff from like batting practices and things where when he gets into a ball on the pole side, he can rip a monster shot. It's just, I don't necessarily know if Zach Veen has fixed what they were trying to do to him because He had that surgery on that tendon thing after 40-something games, and the results weren't necessarily great, right? So he's going to go back to Hartford this year. He is, from what I understand, he's healthy. And I legitimately think that Zach Veen is better than we give him credit for, I think, both offensively and defensively. Offensively, I think when he gets back into the, I'm going for quality contact, not necessarily an opposite field uh, line drive into the gap. I'm just going for the best quality contact I can get. And he's open to pulling balls a little bit more. I think you can see 
the power tick up closer to average as far as what you actually see in the games. Because again, the raw power, kind of outside of what people think, I think the raw power is legitimately there. And then defensively, a lot of the reviews on him are that he's an average at best defender. He played more right field than left or center last year. Two games in center, 13 in left, 30 in right. But when you watch, he's a very intelligent defender. I've seen him deke runners. I've seen him take very good routes. And I think that Zach Bean's one of those guys that could stick in center if you need him to, but he's probably going to get bumped to a corner by a better defender. Like Brenton Doyle in Colorado... I believe was the number one defensive outfielder in baseball last year, right? So if you put Zach Bean in that outfield, he's playing a corner. But I think he's better offensively and defensively than we give him credit for. The big question for me is going to be, can he get back into that more natural see ball hit ball that he did in 2021? At age 19, in Fresno, in 106 games, he batted 301, 399, 501. He was one walk away from a 345 slash line before they tried to mess with him, before Colorado did, tried to change who he was as a hitter. If he can get back to who he was as a hitter in 21, I think he can get back into top 100 lists and what is now a very crowded Colorado outfield prospect group with Norton Beck, uh, Yankee Fernandez, uh, all these other guys. Uh, Daniel Espino is the other one. And I'm really worried Daniel Espino is going to become one of those what-if kind of things, right? Uh, 2019 first rounder out of high school, had a knee injury, ended 2022 after a grand total of 18 and a third innings. And he looked good, 245 ERA, uh, 35 strikeouts to four walks, but also four home runs. Uh, And you're in a situation, he didn't pitch last year because of a shoulder issue. Uh, When he did pitch early last year, the stuff was really good, right? Like upper 90s fastball touches 100 with a ton of... That's a wipeout slider. It's close to 90 miles an hour. It's a 12 to 6 curve. And he's got to change up in there. Like theoretically, he just doesn't necessarily use it a lot. But it's a great arsenal. It's just, when are you going to see him pitch? He lost again. He had a shoulder strain that ended up being that capsule surgery that is terrifying. I would rather have a pitcher with Tommy John surgery than with a random shoulder surgery on the structures, the soft structures of the shoulder. And you can tell that he's not 100% certain about what he's going to be able to do uh, on the on the field this year. He told MLB.com last week in camp, his goals were for this year were one, get healthy, and two, pitch in a game. Pitch one game. Those were his goals for 24. And so hearing that's a little bit terrifying, right? Uh, You're in a situation where Daniel Espino doesn't know if he's going to make any starts in 2024. So I understand why he would fall off a lot of these lists. Baseball America completely removed him. Baseball Prospectus, I believe, completely removed him. I think MLB Pipeline initially had removed him. And then I think something happened and he's now number 100 on their list. When he was, I think, as high as like top 20 on some of these different outlets. And so this is just, I just want the kid to pitch, right? Uh, This is all going to come back to health. And then what the stuff looks like when he finally gets back on the mound. Because again, reminder, he's had a grand total of 133 and two-thirds innings since being drafted in 2019. And after 2021, he had a grand total of 18 and a third. So the stuff was there before the major surgery and before he lost almost two years. Let's see what happens. At this point, we're just hoping the kid's healthy. Fantastic week this week. We've got a draft show coming up tomorrow talking about what you do when you have two or three first-round draft picks. And then we're going to be doing some more stuff. Guys, you might see as top prospects in 2025. We teased it a little bit yesterday talking about Milwaukee Brewers and Yofri Rodriguez. Let's see who else might be on that list. I think we're also going to have some time to do potential lower level breakout prospects, guys who are not in the top 100 list who could explode in 2024. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you've got mailbag questions, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball, shows on Twitter at Locked on Farm. Uh, We've got email, we've got a Discord, all of that stuff in the episode description in the show notes. 
Until tomorrow's show, remember, it's always a great time to make.